So my volatility is going to be simply what? The weighted average of volatilities. So I don't gain anything by the di diversifying. Diversification means simply, guys, that the risk of my portfolio is a smaller than the weighted sum of risks of, of, risk of individual assets. That's, a, that's a, the main point here. When rho equals one, this is the only case in which the variance of the, the, weighted, the weighted mean of the individual variances equals to the variance of the portfolio. So here, there is no diversification. So it's like, like I was telling to you guys, you know, it's like having one asset, that's it. Okay, so you're doing nothing here. Now, if you do rho minus one, let's apply the same formula. This is going to be sigma square, um, is going to be equal to WD square, sigma D square, plus WE square, sigma E square, minus, because rho is minus one, two times WD, WE, sigma D, sigma E. Correct, guys? And as I mentioned to you, this is also a very famous formula. It's simply WD, sigma D, minus WE, sigma E, a square. Correct, guys? And this was fantastically beautiful, okay? Not only for this. I don't know if I use, sorry. Yeah, so this should be sigma p. Forget about the RP. It's, it's my, my standard deviation of portfolio. It's going to be simply equal to this one here. When you have a minus sign here, guys, so this implies that there should be a weight in such a way that sigma p equals zero, correct? We can do that. So if I equal this equal to zero, what I'm doing is I'm creating my perfect hedging portfolio. So what is a perfect hedging portfolio? Well, it is nothing more than a portfolio with risk equal zero. So remember guys, if I did this and I know that this is true, Agree with me or not? As soon as I only have two, if these two sum to one, I can write WE as one minus WD. If I do the, the math here, guys, I arrive to a condition that this is going to be simply If I'm able to simply do this ratio, I disappear my risk. Make sense? I think we did an example, correct, guys? Do you understand that? So let's do some Excel. I will show you some Excel just to, to show you this. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah, are you with me, guys? Make sense? So yes. if th this is a very particular case. So this is a, a case almost impossible to get. But in theory, that, does, that can happen. Got it? So if we go, if we just talk about, Give me one second. I will. Let me find my example. Yeah. So guys, you have this uh, this PDF with you. So let me show you. Where is Excel? Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect. So this was the example that we started developing last class, guys. So this is data. 
Okay, so you have the expected return of debt, eight percent, expected return of equity, thirteen percent, variance of volatility of debt, twelve percent, and variance of E, twenty twenty percent. The covariance is seventy two, is any number, but if you transform this in terms of a correlation, so simply implies that the correlation between debt, debt and equity in my example equals zero point three. Got it? And then what I've done is I've done three examples. What happens if, if rho is minus one? What happens if rho is zero? What happens if rho is one? And I also use another one that is rho equals 0 0.3, just, just to show you how diversification works. Now, what I'm doing is I'm changing, see. <laughs> Why? Juega. Just one second, guys. Yeah. Okay. So, guys, um, so what I'm doing is I'm simply moving WD, okay, from 1.5 then to 1, reducing this to minus 0 0.5. And basically, WE is simply 1 minus WD. You see that formula? It's 1 minus WD. And then my expected return, guys, is simply the weighted average between, for, for this one here, it is simply 1.5 times 8 minus 0 0.5 times 13. So this is the average. You see? So and then you, you do this part here. If you graph the expected return, the expected return is always a weighted average. That's all. It's a line. What is beautiful is what happens with a, with a, with a standard deviation change in row. So what I've done here, guys, this formula here is exactly the formula that I showed you before in, in the class, in the, in the mathematical formula. And if we graph this one here, take a look to what happens. You see this black line here? This is when rho equals one. When rho equals one, guys, implies that there is no diversification. So you're not reducing your risk by putting two things together. However, if you start moving rho towards minus one, so imagine rho, rho, rho equals 0.3. You can see, take a look to this part here between these two lines. You can see that the risk, this is my portfolio standard deviation, so this is my risk. You see that now it makes a kind of a U shape. And when you increase this to rho equals zero, you can see that the U shape becomes more pronounced. And when you go to rho equals minus one, this touches zero. Got it? So basically, uh, there is a portfolio weight, a WE or WD, in such a way that you are eliminating your risk. Got it? That's exactly what we have done in the, um, in the, in the math. So let's try to, let's try to, you have, we have done this by hand or not. I, I just want to show you this by hand. Have you done that? No. I think so. Um, yeah. Okay. So you can see, for example, if you see the math, can you take a look to what is, what is, the, the, what is the, the exact weight on WD, WE when you have rho equals minus one? Do you remember that? Have we done that? So my question is the following. So let me show you. Let me see the numbers first of all. So it's, let me take some notes. So I have uh, 8, 13, 12, 20, 0 0.3. Okay. So what I'm, what I'm asking you guys is the following. Okay. So what I'm asking to you is, imagine guys that you have the expected return of equity. You have done that, so you just give me the number. It's eight, no, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's debt, debt or equity first. Uh, debt is first. Sorry, this is debt. The expected return on equity equals 13%, sigma D equals 12%, and sigma E equals 20%. And I told you, if rho equals minus one, I want you to give me WD, WE, that make sigma portfolio equals zero. Can you find the, the, the values, please? So WD was um, no, I think no, 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 no,
tienes que ir con ella. No es posible. Vaya a enseñar a Francisco. No se ha terminado de enseñar tu clase. ¿Ya está terminando su clase de, con Francisco? So it's, it's a very simple example, right, guys? Yeah, so, so WD was 0 0.625. Right. Okay, so WD was simply sigma E over sigma D plus sigma E. Yeah. And WE will be sigma D over sigma D plus sigma E, correct? So if you simply replace these values, guys, so this should be 20 divided by 12 plus 20. So this is equal to what, uh, ETL? Uh, 0 0.625. 625. And of course, this one here is going to be 12 divided by 12 plus 20. So this should be equal to 0 0.375. Okay. Yes. 375. So with these two weights, guys, okay, so you are basically obtaining uh, the risk of the portfolio. Can you tell me what is the expected return of your risky portfolio? And can you tell me what is my, my volatility of my risky portfolio? We have done that, right? Yes. Yeah, so the first one is yeah. 9.875. Right. So the, the formula here is W oh, D expected return D. Yeah, just to, to be sure that you, you get this one here because this is for sure part of the exam. And this one here is simply W D square sigma D square plus W E square sigma E square plus two times W D W E sigma d sigma e so if you if you see guys once you compute wd and we or wd we you have all the ingredients do you agree because here you have the expected returns so if you simply replace the values what do you get a uh, etl um 9.875 yep and uh, the variance uh, zero zero uh 875 dr oh, 875 sorry sorry 9.875 oh Yep, so let me let me delete this. Yeah. Okay. Guys, do you get how to, to get these numbers? Guys. Guys, you get it? Uh, professor, I just need to you know, I'm still looking at it to kind of yeah. know exactly how this works. So what I'm telling to you guys is that this is a very particular case, okay? This is almost impossible to find in real life. But if you know that you have a row minus one, you immediately know that you can do a perfect hedge for the folio. Okay, so this implies that you can eliminate the risk, basically. That, that, that is the meaning of that. Dr. Renifo, um, yes. you did say it already happens in real life, but is there any real life example? That we can oh, you don't know. We're going to do that. But for the uh, real life example, I need, I need to move more. Yes. Okay. okay. But so, for the perfect hedge one, there's no real life example. Since you know what? No. I never find, you know, I, I'm doing finance guys for almost 25 years. I never found something closer to minus one. I, I found once and very lucky a minus 0 0.2 more or less. But it was once and the, the opportunity disappeared in, in, you know, a couple of minutes. The markets are, are very efficient on, on, type, on these type of things, guys. The markets, the, the markets can create, can clean very, very easily short-term inefficiencies, but they are not so good on long-term inefficiencies, bubbles, for example. You know, that's the issue. Okay? Make sense? So... Basically, if we go to Excel, and uh, where is Excel here? If we see Excel, guys, the graph, so this 0 0.375 is this part here. Okay? Now, what is interesting, guys, is, is the following. So let me continue working on, on, my, on my print. So what, what I told you, okay, this is a very particular case. So we're not going to, to, to find this one here. But in any case, guys, when you have a row that is a strictly smaller than one, 
you always have diversification, right? Now, what is interesting is we can build our POS. So if I have here Sigma P, and I have here expected return of my risky portfolio, and I have two assets, something like that. Okay, one asset has, a, for example, my expected return is eight, my expected return is, I, this, this doesn't look, doesn't look correct. So let me try to use these numbers here. So I have eight and 12, so let's say here. So this is eight and has a risk of 12. And the other one has a expected return of 13 and the variance or volatility of 20. Just by having these two, two dots here that are not perfectly correlated, what you can do is just simply change the weight. If I start, if I give zero weight to, this is equity and this is debt. If I give zero weight to, to E, I will end up having only, only debt, do you agree? And if I give zero weight to D, I will have only equity. But if I start moving from, you know, from 0 0.01 to D, 99 to E, et cetera, you start moving your, your weights, what you're going to be building up, guys, is something like that. And this one here is what is called the portfolio opportunity set. And I will show you how this works in Excel. Sorry, portfolio opportunity what? Set. set. Okay. Yes, portfolio opportunity set. Okay, so we can take a look to how this works in Excel. So you, you can take a look also to your Excel. Look guys, you see this graph here? You see that? So what, what I've, how I've created that, take a look. I'm changing WD and WE, I'm computing the expected return. If I have my, my row, so in this case I use row 0 0.3, I know my, what is my role for each of these combinations. And then I can create this, this one here, guys. Do you see? So as soon as row equals, uh, sorry, it's strictly less than one, you are gonna have this shape. If row equals one, well, in that case, you're gonna have a line. Do you see this part here? This are kind of magenta color is when row equals one. So it's simply a line. But you can see, guys, that this shape, the POS tends to go towards zero, meaning that the standard deviation is, is disappearing, the lower the row. Of course, my graph here is not good, but when row equals minus one, guys, my, my row, my standard deviation is going to be zero. Make sense to you? So the stronger... Right. The, 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 yes. Um, so te technically, it's not close to one. It's just not close to zero. It's just like almost zero. So is that like no, no, market no. risk? Okay. It is zero. No, no, no. It no. already is no. zero. It is already zero. So remember what we are doing. Um, what we are doing here, um, Daniel, is just talking about the uh, systemic, non, non systemic risk. So it's also called the di diversifiable risk. Okay? okay. I can have I can have zero here. I can really have two assets that are minus one correlation. I will have zero risk here. But then suddenly the, the economy collapses and I can, lose, I can still lose money. So what I'm doing here is only the diversification provided by portfolio. Got it? So what I'm, what I'm talking to you guys is basically, uh, how do I go to your side? Oh, here we go. What I'm talking to you is, if we do all this beautiful diversification, we can be around here, very close to, to zero in terms of diversifiable risk. But I'm not eliminating this risk. Okay, so that's the idea of this graph. So I cannot, at least with portfolio management, I cannot disappear the market risk. I can disappear the portfolio risk, but I cannot disappear market risk. Got it? So you can have two assets that are perfectly negatively correlated. So at the portfolio level, you have zero risk. Do you agree? However, something can happen in the macro, in the macro economy and then simply you collapse. You, you can still lose money. So that's why it's crucial that you control 
your, your market risk also. Uh, okay, so let me go back to Excel. Guys, do you understand this graph? So that the portfolio risk decreases as rho approaches minus one. The only case in which you are not diversifying is when rho equals one, because you, you simply have a line, right? Okay, so let me continue my, my whiteboard. So last class, guys, I told you, okay, my POS is like that, but my POS has two pieces of the equation, or two pieces, two, two parts. And these two parts I divided by this, po this point here. Okay, how do we call this point here? We call it, you see guys, this is the minimum variance given my POS, do you agree? So I should find, I can find a, a combination of WD, WE that minimizes my risk. Because there is, the, according to this line guys, I cannot move this direction. So this point here is called my minimum variance portfolio. Okay, so what is interesting guys is that the minimum variance portfolio divides this POS in two pieces. The upper part is called the efficient part and the lower part of course is called inefficient. So why efficient, why inefficient? So let's take a look, a very quick look to that definition. So imagine guys that we take this point here, okay? this 12%. Of course, I obtained this one here, investing all my money in D, correct guys? The, the return I will obtain is eight. Tell me one thing, is this uh, an efficient decision for you? Or you can be better off just changing the, the weights? It's better to change it. Yeah, because if you want to keep 12% of your risk, as your risk, there is going to be a W, 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 D, W, E, that is going to start moving you here, continues moving here and here. Take a look. Perhaps you're gonna get 10%. Do you see that? So that's why from here down is inefficient because you can get a, a combination of portfolio that is gonna give you the same level of risk, but a high return. That's why that, that's the meaning of efficient versus inefficient. Make sense to you? And what I said, I have the formulas around here, guys, and we did the mathematics for that. And, and we said that mathematically, guys, WD, so of the minimum WD, um, yeah, minimum variance portfolio is going to be equal to, we developed this formula with you last class, guys, it's going to be sigma square E minus covariance RDRE divided by sigma square p plus sigma square e minus two times the covariance. And of course, w, w e is simply equal to on minimum variance portfolio is going to be simply one minus w d minimum variance portfolio. Okay. So let's continue with the example. I think we, we, we have done the same. So now assume guys that the covariance of RDRE equals 72. Okay, so tell me what is 
WD minimum variance portfolio. I think we have done that already. And what is WE minimum variance portfolio? And tell me what is my expected return of my risky portfolio and tell me what is my, my volatility of my risky portfolio. Can you check your notes so we can move faster? You understand what you need to do here, right guys? If you have the covariance, okay, you simply replace the number here. You, you write 72. You have the variance. You have the variances. Uh, sorry, this is uh, sigma squared D. And you have the covariance. So all the numbers you have it here. Right, okay, so? Okay, so you simply replace, you find WD, WE. And once you have the weights, guys, then you can find what is my expected return and what is my, my volatility. Can you do that please very quickly? If, you, if we have done that, please just let me know the, the values. Uh, WD MVP equals 0 0.82. 82, perfect. So this equals 0 0.18. Yeah. Right? And once you have these two guys, remember that this one here is simply the weighted average is going to be 0 0.82 times, a, what is my number? Eight plus 0 0.18 times 13. So this is going to be my expected return. So what do we get here? 8.9. 8.9%. And then if I compute my, my, my sigma, okay, so this is going to be 0 0.82 a square. Uh, what is my variance here? 12 a square plus 0 0.18 a square, 20 a square, plus two times 0 0.82, 0 0.18 that multiplies 72 to the covariance. Correct, guys? And then you obtain what? The variance, uh, sorry, this is going to be the variance. 11.9. Uh, 11.9, 11 oh, this, well, I know, 131.04, and then you. Yep, 11 point. Uh, 11.45. Perfect. That's it. Did you see that? It's very simple. So what is the meaning of that? So it means that the minimum variance portfolio here, so let me write these numbers in, in here. So this minimum here, this value here, equals the minimum you can get with this POS is 11.45. And the uh, corresponding uh, return is going to be 8.9. Make sense? That's what we have done now. Questions, guys? Guys, questions? It's clear? So you identify the minimum variance and efficient and inefficient. That's perfect. So let's continue. Now, I, let me let me draw again my my graph. So it was this is uh, twelve. This is eight. This is thirteen. And I have here 20, so I have my POS that looks like that. Okay, so now the other question is the following. Where are you going to be located? In the, if you just have the POS, you as a final client, where are you going to be located? Because remember, these are weights simply. So all this part is efficient, do you agree? So, but perhaps Daniel that is very risk lover, he's gonna be here completely in E. But perhaps ETL that is less risk cover, that is more risk covered, perhaps he's gonna be here and Mariam is going to be very close to here. So any of you can select a different point here, right? So this depends on what? This depends on your, perf in, in your personal preferences. 
Got it? If we, if we draw the preferences, guys, in, in this graph, so basically it's going to be reverted. Normally when we talk about in different curves, we talk about this, this graph, do you agree? In micro? Do you remember this in different curves that represent yes. preferences? Yeah. So in this scenario, guys, the, the indifference curves move this way. So we're going to have this one here. So the bearer is going up. So if you continue doing this stuff, if you are an individual red, you're going to arrive, for example, to this point here. Okay. What determines this risk, this, this, this shape here, guys? Do you remember that? So my expected utility, um, I, I call it, sorry, sorry. I call it utility. My utility guys in this scenario is going to be simply, it's going to depend positively on my, on my expected values. And it's going to depend negatively on two components. Depends negatively on the volatility. The higher the volatility, the less the utility for me. But also this A here. What was this A here? How do we call it? Um, the risk aversion coefficient. Exactly. And remember, guys, please remember, the larger, the more risk averse. Okay, so if we replace the values of my double, my expected value and my volatility, <clears throat> and then I take the derivative of this respect to WD, we did that also in last class, pretty sure. We arrive, guys, <clears throat> to the following formula. WD star, now I'm not talking about the, the minimum variance portfolio, I'm talking about the point where you're going to be depending on which individual risk aversion do, do you have. It's going to be equal to, let me see if I copy this correct, please. Let's be sure that we all get together the same numbers. Of course, WE star equals one minus WD. Makes sense to you? Do you understand the logic, guys? The intuition is what is crucial here. Forget about the formulas for the exam. I will, you know, when you study, try to understand how do we derive these formulas. It's very simple mathematics. <clears throat> and indeed, guys, if you know portfolio, portfolio theory, it is a, a huge plus for you. It's very simple. But the people normally know these formulas, but they don't know how to arrive to these formulas. And what is challenging, guys, for you is really how do I compute my expected returns? How do I compute my volatilities and covariances? That's the mathematics. In financial econometrics, we spend a lot of time on understanding how to derive this one here. But the formulas are going to be exactly the same. Make sense? <clears throat> okay, we did that, right? So following the same example, guys, assuming that A equals four, So you are an individual risk for, guys, but just to give you an intuition, a risk between two and, and six are the ones that represent indi uh, individuals very well, re represent very well individuals in real life. A is a very risk lover. Six is a very risk averse individual. Four is a kind of average individual. You know, most of us, I think we fall in the four. 
in the 50 50 guys you know it's, this is a four okay so you're risk averse but you're not too risk averse like a six but you're not too risk lower like a two got it okay so if we assume a equals four can you please compute what is my wd star what is my we star what is the expected return of this portfolio and what is the volatility of this portfolio <coughs> If you can help me with that. We have done that, right? Can you provide me the numbers so we can move this quicker? Daniel? Oh, mm -hmm. Someone? Have we done this or not? Yes, no? I'm trying to find it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we did it, Dr. Ngifo. Oh, you didn't? Okay, so let's yeah, do we it. we didn't do it. Okay, so let's do it. Because you have the formulas here. Can you do that, please? So WD, you have this value. So we use the same values as before. So my... Right. I think, didn't we... Do, well, we're trying to... Oh, I got the... Oh, there's like a Y star here. and Expected to turn for our... Oh, no, no. We are not yet in, in Y star. Yeah. Y star is the next right. step. Why start is the next step. But at this point, guys, if I don't have a risk-free instrument, I only have my POS, where I will be located in my, in my POS depends on my utility function, depends on my preferences. And the preferences, guys, are measured by this guide that we call the risk aversion coefficient. The larger, the more risk averse. So the more risk averse implies that you're going to be closer to, to the lower minimum variance portfolio because that, that's risk aversion, they agree? The, high, the, the lower my A, so I'm you know, more risk lower, I will be moved towards E, that is more risk, but has more reward. Okay, can you help me guys computing, computing all these four numbers? Let's say three minutes. It's just replacing the values, replacing the, the formulas, and then you, you get it. I will, just to be sure. So what was, it was eight. Plus, oh, sorry, it's minus. Yep. Eight minus thirteen. A, I have said is four. Sigma e, sigma e is twenty squared minus. Remember, covariance is seventy-two. Right, zero point zero one times four times sigma square e is twenty square plus twelve square minus two times seventy two. Okay, if you can help me with that, then we compute W D W E and then we compute our expected return and we compute this one here. Once you compute W D, we Feed the values there. When someone gets the value, please tell me so your colleagues can, can verify that and then we can continue moving. Um, I got 0 0.5075. 0 0.5075. 0 08, let's say. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, let's do two decimals, much simpler. Uh, 0 0.51 then. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, and the other one is going to be 0 0.49, right? I need to someone to verify these guys, kind of a approximate value, a value.
I got the same numbers. Great, perfect. So if we have these two numbers, guys, then we are done. Our life is solved, right? So we simply plug this in my formula of the of the of the mean of the expected return. Then I compute that, then I use the same numbers. So this is going to be 51 square, 0 0.49 square, 0 0.51, 0 0.49. Can you help me with this number? So we all get the same number so you can replicate this later because the exam is basically these guys. I want you to understand how to build uh, the portfolios, what is a minimum variance portfolio, etc. Okay, three minutes. Uh, I got 10.45 for the expected return. Oh, I, okay. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, 10.45? For the expected return. Yeah. Someone expected. to confirm? Guys, someone to confirm? Yes. Great. Perfect. And then what is the variance then? Or the, yeah, sorry. This is the variance, okay? And once you know this one, I can compute. Remember, guys, yeah, this is something that in the exam that people get confused. This is the variance, okay? Remember, in this graph, I have sigma p and I have the expected return of P. So you need to take the square root of, of this number, basically. Don't, don't forget that for the exam, guys, please. Someone? <clears throat> I got um 169.48. Okay, wait, wait, wait. let me 169.48. Point... Four so eight. that should, so the square root of that is 13.01. 13.01, someone can confirm this? I let can me see. confirm it. Perfect, perfect. So now if we go this, if we put this in the, in my, in my graph, guys. So what I'm saying is, okay, I have, um, well, my graph is not so good. <laughs> Let me, just to make this, so I'm looking for 10.45, and I'm looking for a volatility of 13 point. So basically, it will be located here, right? Kind of, just to make it coherent with this one here. So let me erase this one just to make it coherent. Okay, good. Del oh, no, I don't want to delete you. Um, so basically, if you're an individual four guys, and you're gonna get, this is 13.01, and this one here corresponds to 10.45. So utility basically is going to, well, my graph is going to, cheat a little. 
but this one here. So these are kind of parallel, okay? So you're going to be located here, guys. And this one here comes with observable graph, but you understand the idea. Make sense to you? Um, sorry, Prof. Yeah. So, go ahead. what what is the difference between this formula for WD star and the one for perfect hedge portfolio? Oh, it's completely. They, they are related, of course. If rho equals one, so you can change the covariance. Remember that the covariance. Uh, so I can write this one here. Remember, guys, that I can write this as sigma e, sigma d rho. It's the same here. Sigma e, sigma d rho. Okay, just replace minus one. Mm -hmm. So here, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna make a note. If oh, rho so, so, equals so minus one. So this one, one is for, is this, this one is, for when rho this, equals one? This one, no, 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 no. This one here is for generic rho. Oh, okay, okay. This is for generic. So you see in the in my covariance, I use 72. Uh, so in my example, guys, I, I have told you covariance equals 72. And given the numbers, this implies a rho equals 0 0.3. Oh, okay. So I'm using a different number, but if you assume rho equals minus one, if you just replace the values here, you're going to arrive exactly to the same value as, as we arrived before. Oh, so this is just uh, a general formula. A generic formula, a generic formula. And remember this oh. generic formula, guys, is also, is not going to be, is not going to be, is going to be located in the efficient part. And where are you going to be located depends on, on this number here. Okay, so if you want to try later, guys, just try with six, for example. So what do you imagine is going to happen if you, if you have A equals six? So your weight on D is going to be larger. Your weight on E is going to be smaller. So basically, you're going to be, uh, sorry, if it's six, yes, more risk averse, you're going to be located around here. If you are more risk averse, you're going to be located to the left. If you are more risk lower, you're going to be located to the right. Okay, so that's the idea. If you are more risk averse, you always go towards minimizing risk. If you are more risk averse, you go towards maximizing, not maximizing risk, maximizing your expected return subject to a higher risk. Sorry, professors. What is the condition when um, we have an inefficient, um, sorry, like the inefficient part, like in the portfolio? Oh, the minimum. Said, like, the, what's the condi Like, what are the conditions normally? The minimum. The minimum variance portfolio. So, yeah. If you are to uh, so basically, if you are down here, this part here, mm -hmm. this is inefficient. So you're never gonna be there. Mathematically, guys, it's impossible. You're gonna be there. Never. Will never be there. because because remember the where are you going to be located depends on the tangent between this least line here the red line with my black line correct so it's impossible to have a tangent line in this in this part here you see that all right okay so the red is never going to be tangent here it's always going to cross this part here if you see if, if I draw many row red lines. I cannot build a tangent here. The tangent is going to appear in this part here, for sure. Okay, so mathematically, that, that's the way it works. So let's do the, the last step on asset allocation. So, sorry. I will do now again another, another graph. So let me, the same graph, okay? Terrible graph, but doesn't matter at this point. So what I will have is again 13, 20, Oh, sorry, 12, this is 12, 8, 13. 
So basically I have this point and I have this point. Got it? Now guys, here comes what, what is beautiful about this part here. So let's assume now that I have a risk-free that is equal to 5%. Okay, so let me more or less envision my graph around here. Something like that. Okay, so I have E, I have my D, I have my minimum variance, etc. Now assume guys, the only thing that I, I have added at this point is that I have a risk-free instrument. So remember before we didn't have a risk-free instrument. Now I introduce a risk-free instrument. Okay, copy and then I just follow, follow the, the intuition guys for a minute. Okay, so now can you follow me for, for a minute, guys? Now, what I will do is I will draw a line from this point to the minimum variance portfolio. Hopefully my line looks like a line, yes. What do you think about this, this line here? Do you think you can do better than the blue line? Can you obtain better combinations between risk and return? Maybe everything that is above. Exactly. So you know what, what you can start doing is, okay, you know what, I will start moving my blue, I can start moving a little more. Is this green better than the blue? Definitely. Because yeah. all the, all the, for the same level of risk, the returns are higher with the green. Agree with me? So now if you continue moving, 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 what is the limit of the moving towards to the left? Can I create a line that goes like that? No, because I, 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 the, the POS is a limit. So what is the maximum part that I move, that I can move to the right? So I cross my finger that I can make this precisely here, beautiful. Oh, got it. <laughs> Agree? So basically guys, the maximum I can move to the left, because the left means better than to the right, is when I have a tangent point between my red and my black. So how do I call this line here? Do you remember? The line that represents risk-free with a, with a risky portfolio, how do we call this line? Capital allocation line. So remember guys, in the, in the first part of the class, the, when we were talking about the capital allocation, the capital allocation was simply linking two things, risk-free and risky and risky portfolio, that's it. Remember when I draw this one, the capital allocation line, I gave you only two points. I gave you this point here and I gave you this point here. Now, how do I arrive to this point here? It's exactly the process that we have done tonight. So all the, all the exercise guys that we have done up to now is simply to find this point here. This point here, I will call my risky portfolio, P, not the P. Once you know P guys, so that is a tangent to this point here, then you can simply ignore everything and then you can transform this graph into the common graph that we had during the capital allocation line. So your line, your graph is going to become something extremely simple. Simply is going to be the 5%. This is my risk free. Oops, sorry guys, so should be, should be, and I need this one here. This is my capital allocation line, do you agree? That's all what I need. Make sense to you? 
So now what we are going to try to do is how do I find P? Now, guys, do you remember what is the slope of this line? So these P guys had, I'm oh, sorry, the expected return of my risky portfolio. So now this is going to be complete portfolio. Uh, what I'm doing. This is my expected return of my complete portfolio, uh, risky portfolio. And this is my, let me delete this part here. And this part here is the, the volatility of my risky portfolio. Do you remember how do we measure the slope of this line? We call it S and S was equal to what? Is the expected return of my risky portfolio minus my risk free, that is this part here. It's basically tan the tangent of alpha divided by sigma of P. Okay, so how do we arrive to this red line? What I want guys to do is I want to maximize S comes from sharp. What I want to do to find P is maximize S. And maximizing S implies simply that you replace the values of E, E, R, P and sigma P. You know, you know these values. And then you try to maximize subject to W, D or W, E. And then when you do this maximization, guys, this is a nonlinear maximization because you have a, um, a fraction here. And W, D is going to be up and WD is going to be down. So if you do this, you're gonna find an equation that looks like that. So give me one minute that I need to be completely sure that I, I can write this correctly for you. This is E. This is him. What I'm doing, sorry. You have your, your monster formula, but this is the formula that we use all the time, guys. Professor, just to clarify, so here we're trying to find P, right? And we're, we're using P yes, yes, WD. Yes. yes, remember P is a portfolio, do you agree? It's made of a combination of yeah. debt and equity. And the combination, the, the only thing that you need to, to find a combination as soon as uh, the expected returns and volatilities are given is WD and WE, correct? Mm -hmm. Once you know WD, WE, you can immediately identify what is my expected return and what is my expected, uh, and what is my volatility, as we have done previously. Remember, we first find WD, WE, and once we have these two numbers, I can compute everything. It's exactly the same here, okay? So in order to find P, okay, I, I need to know basically what is the weight on depth and what is the weight for equity, and then I will know exactly what, the, what this P is. Once I know exactly what this P is, guys, I, I have found basically this part here and I have found this part here. So I have my, my graph like this one here, the, the one that we did in the first class. Okay. 
Okay, so let's do our example. Please find, you, you have all the ingredients here. So the only thing that you know is I'm giving you the risk three equals five. Can you please find WD star, WE star, then give me what is my, my expected return and what is the volatility of my risky portfolio? Can you please help me compute in that? Okay, five minutes to do that. I will bring my water. Guys, the covariance is against 72, against 72 here. Sorry, Maria, sorry? Covariance is 72 here. Yes, 72, example. like the previous example. Okay, okay. I come in a minute. Here I am.
some more guys, some numbers. Let me let me verify that the formula. Yeah, the formulas are correct. Okay, guys. So remember, you use the numbers as they are, okay? You don't use 0 0.13, you use 13, 14, etc. Ready? Someone? Guys, someone, I have some numbers here and perhaps you can confirm. I obtained um, here 0 oh, 0.4. I, yep. Yeah, I've got 0 0.4. Yes, WD. excellent. And W is then should be 0 0.6, correct? Uh, so you got 0 0.4, just 0 0.4. What's after that? Because I, uh, got, I got more like uh, 0 0.46 or 47, so. No, I obtained here using Excel 0 0.4 sharp. Uh, well, not, let me see if it's sharp. Maybe I just made a mistake in calculations. Yeah, um, yeah 0 0.4 sharp. Okay, this means I probably made a mistake in calculations. If this is not going to take too much time, can we plug in the numbers or is this? Uh, oh, you know, no, 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 let's plug the numbers, of course. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, I will do this here. So WD should be equal to, uh, okay, I have the numbers here. Spectre on D is eight mm -hmm. minus, ah, wait a second, guys. Wait a second, I, I want to be sure that I'm using the, the correct, the correct, risk, the correct risk free, risk free. Oh yeah, 5%, that's good. So this is going to be five minus eight. That multiplies sigma square E, 20 square, right? Mm -hmm. Minus, Uh, 13 minus oh, 13. 5. Okay, I put in uh, 12 for some reason, but yeah. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, it's 13 minus 5 mm -hmm. yeah. times covariance times 72. Mm -hmm. Okay, all these over 8 minus 5 
20 square plus 13 minus 5 <coughs> times 12 square <coughs> minus um, 8 plus 13 minus 2 times 5 that multiplies 72. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and this should be 0 0.4. Guys, guys, if you get 0 0.4, obviously W is 0 0.6. And then you simply go to EERD. So your ERP, sorry, not P is D, is P. Is, it's going to be simply 0 0.4 times 8, 0 0.6 times 13. So you are going to obtain, yeah, 11. And the variance is going to be 0 0.4 square times 12 square plus 0 0.6 square times 20 square plus two times 0 0.4, 0 0.6 uh, times 72, so this is not, this is sigma squared. And, and you, you, yeah, I don't know how much you get it, but let me see. Let me see, so if I take this. So this gives you 201.6 and sigma p equals Fourteen point two. Okay, so basically, guys, what we have here is that this one here is fourteen point two, and that this one here equals eleven. Makes sense to you guys? Oh, if you want to do that, you can do this here also, of course. But once we have this point, we don't need all the POAs. The, the POAs is irrelevant at this point. And this is equal to 11. Got it? Make sense to everyone? Okay, one minute to copy, and then we need to go to the last part. So remember, guys, this is already this part here. This part here is capital allocation. Okay, so asset allocation, guys, is to create a POS just to compute the P. Once we have the P, we forget, the, we forget about the POS. We don't need the POS because all the black line, guys, do you agree with me that is inefficient respect to the, to the red line? Okay, so we simply can ignore the, the POS. That's what I'm saying. Sorry. POS is, sorry, POS is. Oh, this one, um, the portfolio op optimal set. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. The, the, the portfolio opportunity Yeah, set. like the U, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, the kind of, yeah, kind of U yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so now let me move this one here, 11, 14.2, to the last part of this part. That is basically, so now we have sigma c, a spectre return of my complete portfolio. Remember that my complete portfolio is simply made of the risk free and my uh, spectre return of my risky portfolio, that is 11. The risk of the risk free is zero. And this one here had a risk of 14.1, correct? 14.2. And basically what I have from here is a line. This line is called the capital allocation line. Okay, so this is the first card, the, the first class of portfolio optimization, guys. The, the one that we did two weeks ago, perhaps. Okay, and, and now from here, the formulas that you need to remember 
is what is my expected return on my complete portfolio is <clears throat> going to be the risk free plus y expected return of my risky portfolio minus my, minus my risk free remember this one here is weight uh, into risky portfolio so what is my percentage that i will invest on my risky portfolio and then i i know that my sigma c is simply proportional to sigma p so I, I don't develop these formulas, guys, because we have developed we have developed them, uh, you know, a couple of classes ago. And again, guys, the question comes: Where are you going to be located? Because I have this point, I have this point, and you can be located every anywhere in this line here. Anywhere, okay? So it depends on what. Again, depends on preferences. So if you have one individual that has utility, the utility function, the preferences are going to be like that, like, like before. So what we try to find is try to find when the utility function simply uh, is tangent. So we're going to have something like that. I don't know. This corresponds to one individual. So this guy is going to optimize perhaps in here. Okay. Again, what we need to do then is we want to maximize the utility of this individual and the utility of this individual as before, guys. But in this case, instead of portfolio, we have the complete portfolio, the complete investment, minus 0 0.005 a sigma square of p. If we replace these values and we have done that uh, respect to respect to y, we are going to find a y star, and y star is going to be simply. This is your famous Y star. So when we are in the world of capital allocation, guys, we don't have WD, WE. What we have is Y star. So if I find Y star, I can immediately find what is my expected return and I can find what is my, my volatility. Okay, so let's do, let's do this example. Let's continue with the same example. The only missing piece of the equation here, guys, is A. So assume that you are an individual equal four. Can you please compute uh, what is that Y star? What is the expected return of your complete portfolio? And what is going to be the volatility of your complete portfolio? Basically, I'm telling to you, basically, give me the position here. What, is the, what are the weights that are going to locate me, that are going to allow me to identify exactly this number? You have all the ingredients, guys. So you need to find Y star. Once you have Y star, you replace this in, okay, let's call this equation one. And in equation two. And that's it, you're done. Uh, professor, I think we already did this. So I think, I think we can just give the numbers already. Oh, beautiful. So what is Y star? Uh, so Y star when A is four uh, is 0 0.413. 0 0.04. 0 0.413. Oh, good. Okay, so this implies that I will put 41% of my portfolio in the risky investment, correct? So once I have that, I use formula one. And I, I want think- to do this. I'm trying to find it now. Let me check. I think it's the very, it's like the very, the, the last examples before we did asset allocation. So mm. like um, November 11, like the last part of November 11. Oh, okay. November 11, wow, long time ago. Yeah, because we didn't, we, we didn't do one uh, last year. Oh, so this okay. is three classes. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Well, no, because uh, one thing. Then we had we the exam. Yeah. exam. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So what is the expected return, guys? 10.30. Uh, yeah, and my volatility? Um, 9.09. .09. Can you confirm that, someone? Do you have the same numbers? Uh, or I mean, are we using the same numbers as we were using in that example? Uh, remember, no, 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 no. Yeah, I think no. We, huh? we no, no, wait, 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 no. We are using these numbers now. So what is my expected return is uh, 11%. 
what is my volatility is well 14.2 square so we we continue with this example are, are we using these numbers oh hold on I'm guys sure please, we're using the same numbers that time uh yeah please be sure that we're using these numbers guys i'm, I'm continuing with this example here i know we won the last time uh the expected return was 15. oh no 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 forget about that delete oh, that oh okay nope. so it's different it's different it's different it's different sorry sorry yeah good point so remember guys i'm talking about this example okay so i have i know my expected return of p equals 11 and i know uh, that my variance of p equals 14.2 so using these numbers because i'm, I'm using this one i'm using this one i'm using this one etc can you help me it's very it's quick the formulas are, are very small
Okay, so guys, you tell me, so what is Y star? Come on, this should be quick. This is 11 minus five divided by 0 0.01 that multiplies four, that multiplies 14.2 squared, correct? Mm -hmm. So what do you get here? I got 0 0.74. Yes, I... right, got the same. four, four, perfect. Uh, and basically if I have Y star, I can compute uh, my inspector return of my complete portfolio is going to be five plus 0 0.744 inspector return of portfolio is 11 minus five. So what do you get here? 9446. Yeah, 946, that's okay. And uh, this one here is simply a 0 0.744 that multiplies the, the volatility 14.2. So I obtained 10.56? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so what are these two numbers? These two numbers are basically these, these numbers here. So if I draw correctly here, of course it's not exactly that, but this should be equal to 10.56 and this should be equal to 9.46. Got it? So if you are an individual number four, so your risk aversion is number four, you are going to have a, a portfolio location that is 74% a risky portfolio and well, the difference in the risk-free portfolio and you're going to get an expected return of 9.46 and a volatility of 10.46. So this is going to be your final location, guys. Make sense? Make sense? So now, if I decompose my, w, my, my, my risky portfolio, Okay, so for that, I need to remember what was my WD and what was my WE in the previous example, guys. So it was 0 0.4, 0 0.6, correct? Mm -hmm. So this is 0 0.4 and this is 0 0.6. With this 0 0.4 and this 0 0.6, I arrived to this point here. Agree with me? And with this 0 0.74, I arrived to, I will do this blue then. I arrived to this blue part here. Make sense to you? Guys, make sense? Sorry, can, can we? Yes, um, so WD, WE, yes, yeah. WD, WE, these weights here. So I, I got these weights here, guys, from, from this big formula here. So yeah. with 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, you obtain, oh, what am I doing? You obtain 10, uh, sorry, 11 and 14.2 with these two numbers. Yeah. And once you have, so you obtain this red dot here, this part here, uh, well, this should be red. This red dot here, that's what you get with this one here. Make sense? Now, when you go to capital allocation, so basically mixing this red dot with the risk free and seeing where you're going to be located in the capital allocation line, you just find your Y star, with Y star you find your expected return and, and volatility of your complete portfolio, you're going to end up in the blue, in the blue point. But that's because we knew the risk-free. Uh, no, it is because two things. We know the risk-free. This is common. You, you know, in real markets, you know the risk-free. And you know the risk aversion of the individual. Once you know these two pieces of information, you're going to be located in one piece of this capital allocation line. Uh, sorry, my mind stopped working. <laughs> I think, but uh, <laughs> okay. so do we know the preferences of this individual? Like, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Normally, there are just... some techniques. There are techniques to find your risk preference. So you but have it, tests yeah. for that. But in this example, uh, yeah, we, we know just... it. We know mm -hmm. it. We know it. I, I I need to to provide you this number because remember that's the only unknown in this formula. This is known. Oh yeah, because this we is didn't known. Know this a. is known. The only thing that you don't know okay. is a. That's All it. right, so we both know A now in this example, and we know exactly, exactly, exactly that. And for the exam, we should focus on this as well, right? The yeah, in, in the exam, okay, so let's talk a little about the exam, guys. Uh, let me save this stuff and let's talk uh, about the exam, okay, because we don't have time. I have the next class coming next to me. So the exam, guys, is simply capital allocation and asset allocation. Okay, so you need to know 
you need to, to, to know really good these ones. Start with capital allocation. Once you start a capital allocation, go to asset allocation to the class that we have done today in detail. Just go step by step, do the exercises, and you're gonna get it. There is no trick, there is nothing hidden here. What I will do, guys, I will provide you with the formulas. So you're gonna have the formulas. And then you simply, using the data graph. So I, with the formulas, I will ask you for sure, I want you to graph, I, I want you to understand the graphs. Uh, basically, is capital, what is the capital location line, the POS, the, the minimum variance portfolio, the, the efficient versus inefficient, etc. So you need to understand how this works. Okay. And with the formulas, I will tell you guys, you, you know what, I will give you more or less the same, the same, not, not the same numbers, of course, but I cannot trick you in here because I can, the formulas are, are only one. So I can provide you this information, for example. You know, you need to understand what happens if rho equals minus one, the perfect hedge portfolio. You need to understand all this part here. But what I'm thinking is that you're tired now, but I'm pretty sure that you're gonna, if you review this material, what I will do is I'm, uh, I will give you this video. So I will send you all this video here. So allow me, yes, I, you allow me, you know, by tomorrow you're gonna have it. So you're gonna have this video that is basically what the exam has, that's it. Okay, review it, do exercises and that's it. I, I can, you know, even tomorrow I can give you uh, a couple of other numbers and you just play with that and then you can find that the results. Make sense to you guys? So the exam is next Tuesday, no, next Tuesday, next Wednesday at, uh, if you want, we can start a little earlier. Mm -hmm. If you can, if all of you can, that's the point. Yeah, that's not a problem. Yeah, so let's start at 5, 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, at 5 p.m. and then you have enough time to, to do all this stuff. And this is extremely easy, guys. I, really, now I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you just get confused because all of us are tired already. This is late. But go review. And if you have questions, just email me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can, I, can, I can help you. What I will do is I will share this video because this video here is going to contain everything. Basically, it has, it has everything. It has a complete picture of what we need to know for this exam. And what you need to know, guys, in real life is capital allocation, asset allocation is crucial. What I, I recommend you guys, I will also, was, I will send you this email, send you this video. But I also will send you uh, another video that is a security allocation. It is, not, it is not important for you for the exam, but it's good for you to know the complete set. Because remember, there are three pieces in, in portfolio management. It's capital, asset, and security allocation. So it's good for you to know all of this part here. Got it? Security allocation is not part of the exam, but you can take a look to that and just for, for you. Make sense, guys? I need to, be, need to be leaving because I have the next class that is starting right now. Okay, anything, uh, any doubt that you have, please just email me and I can, I can follow up with that. Professor, will, yes. um, I'm not sure if I, I didn't see a syllabus or not, but um, in the, are you, are, um, can I um, like um, have a Zoom call with you on a Friday maybe? Uh, you know, send me an email tomorrow, Daniel, and then yeah. we can set a time. Only because, yeah, like, I have to review everything and see. Yeah, like, review, review like, first. All, all the gaps are missing. Yes, like, review. If, fill in the gaps. if it's not Friday, Monday, early, you know, but review. Review with the email, review, with the, sorry, not with the email, review with this video, etc. And then we can chat. And if you have questions, in, and if several of you have questions, we can do a, you know, 15, 20 minutes session again to, to explain specific points. Okay. Okay. Okay, guys, I, I need to stop. I'm sorry. I, I need to jump no to problem. the other class that we're starting early today. Okay. Uh, See you guys. Take you. care. Bye. My pleasure. Good See you. Good night. Take care.